Wonderful to, to be back again tonight. Uh, and um, Amita, wonderful to have you joining us. Really appreciate uh, you making time at what we all know is, yeah, uh, a very intense time uh, for you and for other candidates right, right now. Um, so by brief introduction, Amita and I met uh, at the end of the campaign uh, as we were uh, debriefing on it. Uh, she is based at, they are based in BC. Apologies, Amita. Um, and uh, went through a pretty incredible campaign uh, last, last year that I'm sure we will hear some about. Um, and when the party speaks of the diversity of the types of people uh, having uh, Amita's background as an astrophysicist, for example, is not the typical lawyer that uh, we might often see uh, considering um, a, a run for the uh, leadership of the party. And uh, I feel we are collectively deeply strengthened um, by uh, Amita being a, a part of the race. Uh, and I know we did a brief land acknowledgement, and I'm, but I'm sure we'll be hearing um, from them on some pretty ambitious policies uh, right across the board, including on Indigenous reconciliation, what that uh, really looks like. And, uh, and so really appreciate it, Amita, you making time, uh, particularly to do this without, you know, set questions and all the rest, but to be open to just a conversation with those members uh, from Waterloo uh, Region that are here with us tonight and those that will be watching afterwards. Um, we also have, I'm seeing some folks here tonight uh, who are Francophone, and my understanding is that Amita, you're pretty comfortable in both English and French. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, appreciate uh, that mix of people that are with us here tonight and uh, having candidates like yourself, Amita, that can uh, uh, connect with people in whichever uh, language they prefer. And so, alors, avec ça, uh, with that, uh, I'll pass it to you, Amita. Wonderful to have you uh, with us here. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me and good to see you again. Uh, et oui, je parle français, alors si vous voulez, je peux répondre aux questions ce soir en français aussi. Et je veux commencer avec uh, dire que je suis sur le territoire non cédé du Sliamon. I am on unceded territory of the Sliamon Nation, which is also known as Laskidi Island, which is off the coast in British Columbia. Uh, my name is Amita Kuttner. I was the 2019 candidate in Burnaby North Seymour, which is in the greater Vancouver area. It's the riding that I grew up in. Uh, I grew up in North Vancouver in general and like right where I grew up was part of that riding, but a lot of it is in Burnaby. I served as science and innovation critic for the party between 2018 and 2020, during which I brought forward policy on artificial intelligence and automation, something that is very much up and coming and not seen very much and it fits in very well with the Green Party's future directed train of thought and policy making. So I was very honored to be able to do that. I completed my PhD in astrophysics last year while I was campaigning and uh, has since been working on starting a nonprofit. And while I was at university, I did a lot of work in student organizations for advocacy for diversity and inclusion. Um, so happy to answer questions about that, but mostly I am honored to be running to present a vision for the party in the country that is not mine alone. I would not be here had people not asked me to run and, and said that, you know, there's a certain vision of what we want our party to be that I represent. So I have taken on that responsibility. What we are primarily focusing on are three core concepts, that of justice, science, and resilience. So to us, justice means our chance at life and equity and the idea that every single person should have equal access to prosperity, to meaningful work, to be able to live a life without prejudice and oppression. And that also includes decolonization looking at the foundation of our country and all the problems with it and wanting to move forward to a place of true justice where we can live together and, and work for uh, a, common, a common future and one where we look after one another. The second idea, I should first say probably that is very personal to me, both because I've done work in advocacy, but also because of my own identity. And I recognize the privileges that I've had that have made it that I get to do what I want and study the things I find beautiful about the world. But I want everybody to have those opportunities and to be able to make those choices. And on the other hand, in all the ways that the world has not been fair to me, I want to remove all that oppression, the marginalization as well, and create the world for what it can be. The second concept of science, 
or really the idea of credibility. The, the notion that we as a party need to have a credible face to the entire country in a way that we will be believed, we'll be taken seriously, and that also we have a policy development process that is truly evidence-based and robust. And politicians say evidence-based a lot, and coming from many, many years of scientific thought and work, I promise you, they do not know what they're talking about. So I would like to get us to the point where we actually have a evidence-based policy process that is based in values, talks about our assumptions, and talks about the vision we would like to achieve. And therefore, we can put policy out there that everybody can get behind and we can communicate it to individuals. So we start with the party becoming credible, and then we take it to make Canada credible again on the national and world stage. The third idea that we talk about is resilience and the concept of preparedness for the future and also preparedness for our mo the very moment we're in. And as a party, that means getting ready for elections. We did well in a lot of ways in the last election and we did poorly in other ways. And there was stuff that came at us that the party was not ready to respond to. And we need to be ready for that. We need to be grassroots organizing far before and I think that Mike's campaign was so amazing because it showed what having a community leader really does and what representation actually means again. And that's what we should be representing. And that's what we can bring forward in a way other people can. But we can't do that without organizing long before and building roots in community. And the other side of preparedness and resilience is getting ready for the crises that we're facing. And honestly, they're all very personal to me. I have experienced climate disaster. I lost my mother, my home, and well, my father's health in a mudslide when I was only 14 years old. I was away at boarding school at the time and that is why I'm alive. And since then I've had my fair share of mental health struggles. So I, I look at the crises that we have now of health, of climate, of mental health and trauma, of inequality, and I see exactly what we need to do to prepare our communities and our country for what's already upon us. And so we think that this is the very moment that we need somebody who has experience in scientific thought, who has lived experience and a trauma-informed approach to policy that can actually inspire and unite an entire nation and create a movement that is inclusive and brings everybody in and speaks to all the individuals. So that's what we're proposing and that's what I'm here to lead. And I'm excited to talk about whatever it is anyone wants to ask me tonight. Yeah, so just a reminder to everyone, uh, feel free to message uh, Teresa with any questions that you have. Um, and I'm personally curious, um, you, you articulated the values behind your top three priorities really well. Um, on, on the first one on justice, do you have any ideas for a specific policy that, uh, you'd, that you'd like to push? Uh, yes. I mean, a lot. So I'll first explain, I think, our, our philosophy about policy development within the Green Party in that we very much appreciate that it's member driven and grassroots. And so what we would like to see and what I think our concept of leadership on that is, is the fostering and driving the conversation, but not determining where everything ends up. And also helping the membership have the tools to develop policy. So on our campaign, we have, a, we have a policy team and we're going to be putting out a full platform very soon that gives a bunch of policy suggestions with the idea that we've, we've worked on practicing this policy development process and we hope to share it and then leave it up to the membership about what policies we want to go forward with. But around justice, I think there are so many and it's tough when something is a, is a lens for every, every piece of policy that you put forward to, to pick only a few. But for let's say democratic engagement. We wanna make sure that people actually have access to representation. So there's policies around the ones that the Green Party has for a long time, for instance, like lowering the voting age to 16, or making sure that there are programs to help support people actually participate in political life. Um, and then when it comes to stuff like decolonization, there are so many things to start with. Some of the very basics are things that are already in Green Party policy, like, actually providing drinking water and mental health resources, but goes a lot further to actually having the conversation about what a true nation to nation par partnership looks like, where we're centering on host nations and having an understanding in all our policy of indigenous rights and sovereignty. So it isn't this, this concept of assimilation or anything so much as fully acknowledging true sovereignty and international law. Um, 
And then on the other side of the, the very notion of justice is justice reform of our policing institutions, but also of the way we treat crime in prisons, both addressing the underlying causes of crime, whether it be poverty or other systemic pressures, and wanting to make sure we actually have a recovery justice model that helps people not reoffend, or if they cannot be helped, then kept away, but getting away from that concept of incarceration as punishment, but rather helping people to have a much improved society. Thank you. Uh, I'll pass it over to Stacy. She has a question. Hi, Amita. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so my question is, um, in line with what you were just answering and related to what Mike had mentioned earlier, it seems to me that the Green Party has an issue in terms of uh, bringing in a div diverse group of, of people um, and backgrounds. And so I'm wondering if you have ideas on how we can address that. Lots of ideas on how to address that. So a lot of my work when I was at university started with this, started with seeing how uneven representation was in, in the physical sciences and how weird that was and how much prejudice there was that actually reinforced that concept. So in that environment, it was like, well, you know, everything's actually fair and it's just, these are the only people that can do physics, which is clearly not true. And so what we see in the equivalent in the political space is the people that are here now are the ones that have some set of privileges to be able to do so. And they're different for every person, but there are a lot of barriers for engagement and involvement, a lot of which I've seen or I've heard from other people in stories, but the main lesson that I want to bring forward from my work in diversity there is the idea of creating safe spaces and belonging so that when people are in this movement, they don't feel pushed out. They feel like it's theirs. They have agency and ownership over it and that their voices are actually heard and that they matter. That we're not looking at diversity from tokenization. We're not focusing on people's identity and saying, you're only here because of this, because that gets you go down a dangerous road if we end up there. And instead making sure that they feel coming in. And once you have that, then you can, but in order to have good outreach programs, you have to make sure that volunteers are actually trained to engage in culturally sensitive ways. And I don't mean cultural just in the type of like racial heritage type of culture. I mean subcultures as well so that we are welcoming in youth, we're welcoming in queer and trans people um, and kind of every demographic. We have issues as well about ableism and, and of course racism. So in all these areas, there are very clear set ways that we can learn to understand other people's perspectives and then know how to talk in ways that are comfortable, safe and easy and start bringing people in. But the first step is always to make sure the space that we're bringing people into is one of, of belonging. Great, James, James, do you wanna jump in? You're on mute right now. Okay, hi Amita. Um, hi. Thanks for all your answers and thanks for your time. Um, I'm Stacy's husband. Um, so you have both the scientific background and the lived experience of climate change as you mentioned, which I think is um, incredible. As a scientist myself, I worry a little bit about how we convey what we know. And I think that um, in the Green Party, we, we have a messaging problem. So I, I said this to one of the other candidates that I think we have this tendency to bring facts to a story fight. And we're in the middle of a story fight. We really need to find a way to galvanise people around a better future. It can't be a story that's about the negative things that have been happening or the the climate breakdown, it has to be a story about the better future that we can have. Do you see ways in which you can sort of cultivate that better story? Yes, and I'm so happy that you said that because that is exactly how I feel and how I've been feeling for a while. And a lot of it comes from, from having a scientific background and working on scientific communication that I, I totally get that you actually need to sidestep it a lot of the time. And what I think we have as an opportunity is exactly what you said we need to be presenting a beautiful vision of the future. One that, that is about well-being, one that is about robust and resilient communities, 
one that is about taking care of each other and the things that connect us and the ability to empower everybody to create that future together. And we need to base it in solid science, but we really shouldn't be out there spouting random numbers and facts. And it's interesting because it's come up. I don't tend to speak that way. I, I tend to speak in stories of my personal experience because that's what connects with people. And then people say, well, yeah, but you don't know your stuff. I'm like, hold on. I do actually, but it's very much a choice that I don't speak that way because I want somebody to connect with the ideas, with the people, with the stories, with the concept that then they need to get in their head about what their future can be. And of course, we have all the backup and the credibility and all the other things to be there to give us strength. And we can go there if anybody wants to. And we should also actually probably work on methodology of explaining climate science to people, but that shouldn't be our focus. Our focus should be that individual experience, that heart, that connection that creates our future, but also draws people to the ballot box. And I, I have some actual concrete ideas too, in terms of messaging for this, uh, in creating a national messaging strategy that doesn't alienate people, because we've seen that what comes out of the national office in the last election pushed people away across the country. And we want to make sure we take into account what the different regions have and then use communications experts to make sure they're expressed in ways that everybody can understand. And this is actually something that we've done with our platform. You know, whatever tendency we might have to throw in numbers and exact stuff, like we don't have the ability to have an economist go through a budget for us at the moment. So we also got somebody to go through it for accessibility, make sure the language is at a level that everybody can understand. And that's, that's a fundamental piece and it's, it doesn't end there because I think the other side, other than the national messaging strategy, is helping people at the community level have a, a messaging strategy that works for their own home. And what is it in every community that is actually the biggest issues right now? And how can we tie that to our vision, communicate it, and tell the stories that people need to hear? Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Teresa has a question. Oh, yes. Um, I was wondering who um, really inspired you growing up and what lessons do they teach you? Many different people. Um, it's tough to say because there's different, different lessons from different people and when does the growing up end? So under what years do I, do I count that? Because I would say I'm still growing. Um, earliest, it was my mother. She was a very classic environmentalist from when I was very little. I was taught from her, from her guidance, a love of nature that I will never leave behind, a connection to the forests around me that has been with me for forever. And also, you know, this was what, early 90s, I'm kind of young, um, but you know, it, she was already like, let's not use plastic, we won't use the dryer, let's hang up our laundry, let's make sure we don't fly too much. Like this was already the conversation that I was with. And so that idea of what life can be and the impact we have started with her. And so did the way that we treat each other and treat other people. And so did the concept of leadership. Because she was, at the time when I was a kid, and well, when she was still alive, she was department chair at the college that she taught at in computer science. And she had taken that department from one of infighting and fear to one of collaboration and kindness and growth, all by being herself and challenging quietly the structures that hurt everybody and making people feel safe. So that was my first, that was my first lesson. And, and how to lead within an organization. And it's something that I, I carried with me and applied and found different mentors along the way that taught similar, similar things. Um, some of my heroes have always been um, Nelson Mandela and Jane Goodall in the ways that they see the world, they treat others and um, express leadership, I guess. Your, your mother sounds like it, an amazing person and I can see why yeah there's um yeah you still feel her loss so deeply so thanks for sharing that 
Uh, right now, COVID is kind of at the front, forefront of a lot of things that we're talking about. And um, two issues in particular, the uh, um, long-term care homes have been hit hard by, by COVID. Um, could, you, could you speak to that? Um, do you have any thoughts uh, on policy that we can yeah. uh, develop moving forward? Yeah, a couple things there. The first one is that we definitely shouldn't have a model for long-term care and for elder care that is privatized because it allows people to turn love, care, and what should be a beautiful time of life into profit and abuse. So that's a, one thing. But I, I don't think that's quite enough in that we have to address the fundamental problems of the very concept of putting our elders in boxes somewhere else once society has decided that we're done. And I think that that is a pervasive culture we actually have to do something about because it isn't just about elders, but about everybody and the way we're defined in our value, our worth, our, whether we deserve to live in dignity, which we all do. But to say right now under that concept, only if you are productive, do you have value? And we've lost everything about being there for each other, about caring, about connecting, and about having communities where everybody has an important place, where all the knowledge that is kept by our elders is not just lost and shoved away and ignored, but that we grow and we continue to connect with those people as they age. So there's policy around that for sure that can solve some of the immediate problems and it has been technically they're not supposed to be privatized as it is now by federal law but we need to make sure that that actually happens and then we need to talk about the concept of long-term care and connection and what some of the simple things are we can do so some of those involve having multi-generational -gener programs for connecting and also a guaranteed livable income but also the way that we don't remove extra senior supports and support community building initiatives in general. And then um, similarly still on the topic of COVID, it's also hit the economy hard and um, it's still, despite making it human like you're, like you're talking about, um, the economy uh, is important as well. And do you have strategies of uh, moving forward on that front? Yes. And it's an important moment to see that globally everybody is going through the same thing. So we should look back to what is what are the fundamentals of a functioning economy and what the point of it is. So in the leadership race and in general, Greens talk about circular economies. And there are so many circular economic models out there now that people are looking at developing with the idea of sustainability, long-term stability, and also moving towards zero waste. But it should not end there. We should also look at whether they increase inequality, whether they're just, and where they focus. And I think the best hope we have is to really localize our economies. And as we go forward, lean away from austerity measures because what they do is they take away from the majority of people and try to bail out large corporations and organizations, which does not actually result in most people having an easier time living, and instead support individuals and small businesses to restart. Because if people on the ground have the capability of participating in their local economy, it will get back to a place of strength. And this is also the perfect opportunity that we look at other things like getting a universal basic income or guaranteed livable income of some kind to also help that jumpstart actually looking at how locally circular economic models can work and moving past just using GDP to using a marker of well-being. So we're measuring lowering inequality, we're measuring increase in health, increase in access to food, water, shelter, you know, all the things we should have. Thank you. Stacy, do you have another question? I do, thank you. Um, one of the questions that I've been asking all of the candidates that I don't love to ask, but it's just a pragmatic question. And that is, if the party decides that, that your writing is not the best for you to run in, um, as our leader, would you be willing to move to another writing? Yeah, 100%. I would say personally, I've decided that I don't think this writing is the one I should run in. 
<laughs> so <laughs> I'd definitely be willing to go. I have some opinions about where I, where I would go. Um, but I also want to respect the decisions of membership and have it be not just up to me about what I do because I am a representative as leader. And I think the other important piece there is that one of the most important parts of who we are as a party is that idea of representation and representative democracy being more important than partisanship. So I am happy to run anywhere. I'd be glad to, it'd be a fun experience, but I also wanna give the opportunity if there is a really strong local candidate that has a chance of winning, they're gonna do a better job of representing that riding than I would. And I think that it's more important that they have a chance to run than making sure the leader gets in the house. We have a lot of growth to do. If we were a bigger party with more seats, I think it would be primary to get the leader in the house. But right now, I think I can do just as much outside the house as in. And if somebody can get in an MP that will be theirs for a long time and do the best job representing, I want them to have that opportunity. Uh, Teresa has a question. Uh, yes, um, there have been many attempts across Canada in BC. I know there's been uh, several referendums on it on getting proportional representation in. Um, how do you see a pathway um, to getting that done? Um, just sort of, yeah. Yeah. I worked on the referendum in BC, very frustratedly worked on the referendum in BC, because it's, it's a really personal thing to me. I don't feel represented at all. And half of what I feel like my job is here is to create space for people that aren't represented. And so the fight for proportional representation is not about having a better democracy, which I really care about, but it's not just that concept. It's about the very core idea of representation and how lacking that is. And not about just strength of democracy, but having one that is even basically representative. And I kind of think that there is multiple, there are multiple trajectories that we should be looking at instead of trying to just focus on one because of how important it is. Um, one of my biggest frustrations during the referendum was the communication about it. And this is exactly about when you maybe try to tell people too much math <laughs> instead of actually telling people what it is that you're fighting for. Because I would be door knocking and people would say like, oh, well, I don't think any of these systems work and I don't understand how they work. I'm like, well, great, but I don't feel like I live in a democracy. Um, and the, there, was, there was an impasse there because of all the information that was there and how it wasn't connecting to people at all. There was no heart, there was no story, there was no individual reason for people to want this. So I think one of the things we have to do is communicate well, work with other organizations that are forwarding these ideas and try to get the public support that's necessary to make sure that it happens. The other thing I think we should do is not be too attached to whatever model is possible and collaborate with other parties in the house to say, okay, what can we get through? What do we agree on enough? What should we try? Let's say we maybe hold a referendum later to actually see if this is what everyone wants to keep, but we have the ability to put something through. So find out what everybody can agree on to actually try and see if we can orchestrate that to happen and use kind of conversational and collaborative methods in conversation with other parties to see what we can get them to do. Um, I worry a little that the Greens are the only party that really, really care about it from a actual value standpoint, because a lot of other parties will walk away from it or do a bad job of it once given the opportunity because the system of parties that we have now helps them all because they feed on that division and we don't. So both developing communication methods to get the public support necessary and working with NGOs in that case, as well as developing the communication methods that we need to use to talk to other parties to convince them that it would actually serve them as well and how they can tell their members it's a good idea. Thanks. Uh, Mike has a question that ties in nicely. Hey, can Amita. I, uh, it's something we've spoken about before, but I wanted to ask it for the benefit of others that are here too. Uh, it's related to this idea of whether our elected officials are representing the people that elect them versus the parties that they are a part of. Um, and so curious if you could share um, your views on the balance between what is united or what unites members of, par of parliament uh, with the Greens and also where there is room for 
MPs to vote um, and speak to their values and to their constituents. Um, uh, yeah, so if you can share a bit about your views on that, that'd be really helpful. The first thing that I always try to remember is that regardless, every MP should never be representing just themselves. And so, you know, we, we need to make sure that our candidates understand that beyond anything else. It is, it is to represent people that we are elected. And I very much appreciate that as Greens, it is something I think that also holds us together. Our primary responsibility is to find out what our constituents are dealing with and help them with it and vote in ways that will improve the lives of the people that we were elected to represent. But we are something and that's part of it. And I think what we are is we're held together by our values, our six core principles of, and the concept of the world that we have, the philosophy of life that we share, which is something that the other parties don't have. And you know, this comes up, when can you vote one way or another? And as we look towards having a much larger caucus, this is a conversation we need to have. And I think that it's not super complicated. We should look at distributed governance models to make sure that we have a, a, an ability to react in situations when we need it. But, and, and also in the case, say, if we would be accidentally taking a government down, we need to get on the same page to make sure we don't do that unless we really want to over something trivial. But everybody would be there with the responsibility to never betray our values and what, what we collectively decide them to be and that there needs to be a process of us figuring out what it is that our values mean to us as members of the party. But then always it is our responsibility to be representatives. And it really, I feel like it's the other way around. If there is any time that we would vote away that disagrees with our constituents, that's when we have to excuse it because we'd have to go back and say, well, I, I disagreed. So how do you work through that disagreement? is more important than, than the other way around. And I think that, that that responsibility and that idea of you know, representing and taking people to government rather than partisanship to the people is what ha gives us the hope of strengthening our democracy. Yeah, thank you. That's helpful to hear. I'm wondering if others might want to also hear if you could share, Amita, where you stand around whipped votes specifically. And also in vetting candidates, this is something this came up again in, in the last election that a lot of candidates, myself included, I'm sure you as well, had to navigate. Um, and so, if you can, if you can share it all, or you're open to sharing where you stand in terms of the vetting process to align with the values you spoke about. We need a far more robust vet vetting process. That is very clear, <laughs> and I think that's also where the concept ties in that we're not there to represent ourselves we're there to represent constituents and also then secondarily the Green Party and the values. So if there's something that comes up against that that really doesn't agree, we have to know that ahead of time and we have to have the chance to talk about it. So the things that have come up in the past that have been probably the scariest, one of them was Holocaust denial. We need to have been able to figure out that somebody held that view and say, no, that is directly against Green values. But the, one of the bigger ones in the last election was about abortion rights and that one to me is interesting because I do not think that there is a good reason to be anti-abortion rights if you are following green values and evidence. Because a lot of the arguments for being even anti-abortion, for instance, if you look at evidence and you say, well, what if your goal is, for instance, to lower the number of abortions that happen, it turns out supporting people's right to an abortion helps that. And, and so there, you know, there's, there are discussions to be had, but we need to be very clear about the things that our values actually state. And especially the intersection at, of evidence and values and the types of things that we just don't have room for. And that would be an example of that. I think there are others as well. Um, and having those laid out very clearly so they don't come and get us later. But my tendency would be to a conversation. So we should have a much better questionnaire for candidates to fill out about these things and they you know basically swear that they're being honest in them to acknowledge it and if there are things like this that come up we have to have a conversation with these people and say we don't want to write off anybody if it's just like a an opinion or something but you have to explain where you disagree and we have to talk about any 
things of disagreement in an interview format so that we actually know what it'll look like. And that is where we should decide whether somebody can be a candidate or not. Because you can have people that disagree with party policy that is in our platform. We've allowed that forever. I had things I disagree with in the Green Party platform. I was still appointed science and innovation critic. But there was a conversation there about what it is and how I would be representing green values and how one would disagree. And that needs to happen if there's any case of disagreement so that we don't have people saying, this is what I'm representing. And especially because you want to be able to represent your constituents there. So when it comes to, um, and, and so that's, sorry, that's why I think there's, a, there's the tension is because if these are personally held beliefs, they shouldn't be coming up a lot of the time anyway. So if they would, then that's already not a representative process. And so it needs to be about what it is that people are actually asking you to vote on. And if you disagree with that, then you have some issues yourself to deal with. And if you see differences between that and party policy, then it's a conversation that needs to happen there. In terms of whipped votes, I don't like authoritarian control. I am a fan of distributed governance, of staying away from having too much power. I don't think it's stable. I don't think it's safe. I don't think it's something that actually is healthy for people to exist in. So I very much lean away from controlling anybody. Um, what I do think we need is when you do have a large enough caucus, you need an agreement on what to do if you're risking the fall of the government or other serious situations like that. Um, that everybody needs to be able to get on the same page sometimes. And there needs to be a process to make that work. Consensus building is complicated and I think it's fun, <laughs> but it can be time consuming. So there needs to be kind of a, a simpler process to say, okay, who actually has expertise on these things? What arguments should we be listening to? And that needs to be values-based and values-driven so that in cases where it's suddenly important, you can get the caucus onto the same page. And I think in issues where there's stuff that's so different, like say in a Green Caucus, somebody saying, well, I, I'm anti-abortion rights. They would have a really hard time staying in caucus with everybody else if that was the case, if they decided to stand on it. But at the end of the day, I can't force anybody to do anything. Thank you. Clear attention there and great insights into the topic. That's great. Um, before we wrap up, um, is there anything else that you want to share with us that we haven't covered yet this evening? Just to say, um, the leadership race is a very interesting thing. And I am running against some fabulous people and some fantastic leaders. And so I would suggest that everybody think about what it is that we actually want from leadership. And for my own part, I've been having these conversations myself and thinking about what it is that I bring and why it is that I think I'm the right person to do this. And it comes down to the era that we're in right now for the party. I see some other people, I'm just like, you'd be great, but I don't think you're the right person for right now. Because right now, what we need is to build a movement across the entire country, is to explain the idea of a way of life that people aren't used to thinking about, that I think I happen to have the right qualifications and experience to be able to do. And the other thing is about the environment of the movement that you build. And I have not had a great time in politics. I didn't tell you much about it, but Mike alluded to it earlier. I didn't have a great time in the election last year. I, in fact, had a number of very difficult experiences. So part of my job here is to make sure that we make the space for other people to be in politics safely, enjoyably, even. And what has been my greatest joy is somehow my campaign has turned into a beautiful space. We're having a lovely time together and we work really well together and it's a great sign. And that is what I would like to see the party be and the Canadian political space be in the future. And that's what I wanna share. So with that, absolute open invitation for anybody who would like to join us as we continue on this journey. Um, and if you'd like, go visit my website at amitakutner.ca or email me at info at amitakutner.ca if you'd like to talk, because I'm happy to chat longer with anybody if you have any questions or send questions by email. And Great. hope I see you all again. And one final reminder is that we need more people to vote in this leadership election. 
So we have until September 3rd to get new members. It is all of our responsibility as Green Party members to get more people into the party. So please get your friends in. And while they're joining, if you get them to join on your favorite candidate's website, then we get their membership fees. Thank you very much, Amita, for your time and your insights. Um, I really enjoyed the session and um, hope everyone else did as well. Thanks everyone for joining as well um, to, to yeah, be part of this. Um, I know David had a question. So Amita, if you're interested to stick around afterwards um, and anyone who's interested to listen in. Uh, Stacy has just posted the dates for the upcoming uh, Q&A sessions with uh, the remaining candidates in the chat. Uh, so those are coming up and uh, Amita mentioned the date uh, for when to um, get people to be members by so that they can still participate in the election. They're posted in the chat now as well. So with that, thank you everyone for joining. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll give it over to David if he wants to ask his question. Hi, sorry, I had a little hard time unmuting there. <laughs> so uh, basically, Amita, I'm, I'm wondering about your vision on how we can maybe get our wonderful documents into the public, public spotlight. Like most people in the country are outside of our tight knit green membership circle. And the people in the community, they, they have no idea what Mission Possible is or this most recent document we have, which is very, very solid in uh, reimagining our future which it'd be wonderful if we could find some way to get these things out. And I, I know that we need to more storytell rather than deal with facts, but there's stuff in these documents that people need to know so they don't view us as a narrow-minded one-issue party or people that don't have a plan and know how to, to do things. So what's your vision on how we can be better at getting these kinds of things out so that people are aware of our, our, our broad-based policies and our, our plans? It's all about how we show up and that's how we show up at the federal level on the national stage. And it's also how we show up in communities. So I think you, we need a communication strategy that actually does a good job of talking about a lot of the details, which we simply have not had. We have the party put stuff up, but it's usually one document and that doesn't get shared widely online, for instance, whereas where it shows up. And there's very little conversation about what exists in it or the communication methods you might want to use to actually express the details and how they relate to people's lives. But even then, there will always be a limit to how much you can get that across without doing some community-based organizing. So I think our strongest hope and the best bet of actually communicating who we are is to do grassroots organizing. It's on the ground in every single community where we have some greens, give those greens the tools to build their communities and their groups out in a way that people aren't feeling like partisanship is forced on them, but that we are showing the example of the future that we are sharing with people. That's to do with Mission Possible. It's also to do with the Just Recovery Plan that we're putting forward. Uh, and it's to do with kind of all our policies and our vision in general, because that's the way we also get strong candidates when it comes to the election, it's having community leaders. But the place where we can communicate that is by making connections before partisanship. People generally don't want to listen to stuff from parties in general. So they only get bits and pieces of national media and what their friends say. And we have to get into the friends say part of that where people engage with us at the community level and they see what things actually are. And there we can talk about the details and by starting to set up some of the systems ourselves on the ground, especially when it comes to things that we're actually experts on that are necessary right now, like food security. There's a lot of work we can do that will show us to be the credible option for the future. And absolutely investing in creating a messaging strategy for the national level where we pick the right things to say that people are going to find interesting. And right now, I think we do have a tendency to put things out either wholesale in a way that doesn't grab attention or just in a way that people don't grab onto it because it's just, you know, where, how do you stop getting from the place where oh, it's the Green Party saying something over there to, oh, ha, huh, I saw this interesting idea and this is, a, this is a concept that I want to explore and the very notion that where we sit with our green mindset of the way we imagine the world is very different from where a lot of people are. So our job is to not just tell stories 
and express and explain the different ideas that we have, but open people's minds to start down the road to understanding why it is that we feel the way we do so that they get there themselves and they start dreaming of the world with us. Thank you, Amita. Is there anyone else that has any last questions? Otherwise, uh, we'll wrap up. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, really enjoyed the chat. And um, I hope everyone has a, a really good evening. Hope Thank you so you much at... for having me. It was great to see you all. Thank you. Thank you.